Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. We're so excited about our episode today. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I'm a builder and futurist at the intersection of music, tech, and story. Across the pond, Mr. Fielding is with us again, a brilliant writer, lore developer, and uh, and procrastinator. Old gamer. Old school oh. gamer and, and procrastinator today. Okay, what do we have yeah. for that? How are you, man? No, What's uh, up? Old school gaming, yeah. I, sometimes we bring props to the show. And if I would have brought a prop to the show today, it would have been my N64 joypad because I think it was one of the greatest inventions of the 1990s. Um, procrastinate. Yeah, actually, can I, I, I've got a question for you. So uh -oh. I want to, it's not, it's actually, I want to see what you think, what makes you more curious about this. So this week, next week, last week, every week, I'm researching two articles. One is on something that's kind of connected to today. There is some kind of link there, one which isn't. So the first one I'm researching about brand gaming collaborations. So brands which are using games to, well, hack new audiences, I guess, is the, is the priority. And then I'm, so I'm researching that, which brands are doing it well, which brands are doing it badly, why they're doing it, what they how that might change the next few years. The other piece is about um, AI self-driving tractors, emerging technology and agriculture, like can AI feed the world? Um, which one of those spikes your curiosity the most? Which would you like to- Oh my gosh. Um, read first or delve into? Man, so universal or interesting applications of AI is 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 kind of fun, right? You know, um, tractors, I don't know, tractors and farming and AI, that's that's pretty interesting. I mean, farming has been doing sensors and, and info gathering and big data kind of stuff for a long, long time and, and automating that could be interesting. I don't know. Both of them have a little nugget to them. You know, the brand game thing is interesting. Um, always authenticity to me comes out with with a brand doing something to yeah. uh, to connect with a, their existing audience or a new audience. Um, but you're always on to something, man. So which one is your go to? You have to read one of them. Which one are you going to read? Man, I would probably go with a tractor because I've been inundated in the brand space for a while. So something yeah, new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Means awesome. Well, today, today I am I, again. You know, you know this, Mark, but I'm I'm such an, uh, a music tech nerd. I always have been. You know, trying to figure out how tech can can help music and reinvent music. And we've talked about things like bi-directional value exchange, meaning that there is there is uh, creation and feedback and potential monetization from both sides of creators yep. and audience, which is really interesting. Uh, we're on a reinvention of music, I think through emerging tech in a lot of interesting ways. I mean, some ways, you know, AI gets gets folded in and, you know, having people create music with AI and the, and the upsides and the downsides of that, but also bringing, bringing music into uh, gaming, I think is one of the most promising uh, applications of this intersection. And, and we've been following these guys that we're talking to today for quite a while. They have a rich history in music a rich history in gaming. Their team that they put together um, is is really is really cool, and what they're building is is really fun. So I'm really excited to, to talk to those guys today. Um, first of all, we want to say hello to our sponsor, great supporter of the show, Ripple with a W W R I P P L E Marketing's on demand talent platform. So hey, we're getting kind of into fourth quarter land. Maybe there's a new assignment that's landed on your plate. You need to flex out with um, with some you know staff augmentation, bring a specialist on for a project. They also have great technical resources related to Web3 emerging tech. W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. Those guys are great. Um, um, just on that, some big names as well, because I'm on the platform now and I actually got an email just, I think it was yesterday, from um, Coca-Cola are looking for someone that fits my profile. So, you know, big names. If you're, if you're a sole opener, check it out. Amazing. All right. Well, let's let's get into this, Mark. Uh, without further ado, we're going to bring on our, we have two guests today. So we got a little uh, uh, double duty. It's going to be awesome. We're going to bring them on, let them introduce themselves, and we will get right to it. We have Jesper and David joining us. Uh, welcome to the show, fellas. David, why don't you give us a quick introduction and then we'll pass it over to Jesper and get right into this. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you, Jeremy and Mark. 
Um, yeah, my, my background, I'm the one who comes from a gaming background. I started back in the, in 87 with a company called Electronic Arts as they started to hire their first people outside of North America before they even had an office. So I, I started, um, you were talking about the N64 there, Mark. I started back in the days of the C64 and the Spectrum. So going back a little bit further and um, started with them in a commercial role and then got involved in um, opening up the offices and working very closely with the development studios um, in lots of areas and marketing teams on what they should be launching on what platforms and um, very much into both uh, language and cultural localization licensing. And um, was there for 27 years. So you can do a lot in 27 years. Saw technology transitions go from C64 close to where it is today. So Incredible. very privileged to have been on a, an exciting journey. Multiple tech cycles in in that in that amount of time. It's it's amazing. And so what pattern? Before we get into yes, for one quick question for you, David. Like, what patterns did you notice over the course of 27 years in the evolution of tech? that you found interesting and applicable as we move forward? I think initially it was very much a hobbyist business um, back in the 80s and the people who were playing games were also trying to make games out of their bedrooms. So, you know, I, I think on the technology side, as the technology began to move on, it widened dramatically. And one of the things we're actually going to touch on today with technology came the ability for personalization. And, um, you know, and that started really in the early 2000s where people were wanting to personalize and the, the ability of the technology then to bring on a lot of gamers. And then on the on the technology side, as far as um, development goes, the rule based systems in graphic physics and lighting suddenly an allowing developers flexibility to create open worlds and for worlds to be generating around the gamer rather than everything being sort of on rails, which it had been up until then. And we'll touch a little bit later on what we're doing and how music then becomes a part of that. Um, and I, I think then it, it really was, you know, that, that sort of explosion of graphics and real worlds that brought on um, an explosion in gamers. It's, I like that similarity between the early internet and the early gaming where you said it's bedroom, it's hobby, it's people are playing the games and making the games and people are we're exploring the internet and making internet sites. And my question, you just answered it. I mean, I don't know how many people played games in the 90s, but obviously now it's it's a Goliath industry, it's the biggest entertainment vertical in the world by a factor of four or five, I think. And do you th so you think it was the graphics that was responsible for that explosion into billions of players? I think, I think it was the graphics um, got people's attention and then the technology allowed the gameplay to get to a depth that had never been there before. And once you then added the online component into that and people began to interact and the whole social side exploded, you know, then you find a lot more, the, the sort of um, technology went from the bedroom into the living room. Um, and and that, that was a huge difference because suddenly then, whether they liked it or not, other members of the family began to get exposed to what the, the, what the gamers in the family were doing. So I, I think the, the combination of those together, you know, the steps, um, you know, built up. And as, as you say, it sort of exploded to where it is today with over 3 billion people playing games worldwide. Yeah, okay. yeah ab absolutely. And, and one important thing that David mentioned just a second ago was the idea that, um, you know, the visual elements were becoming more interactive as gaming and the tech got better. Right. So we're going to put it, put it, put that on the, on the pin board to explore yeah. here in a few minutes. Cause I think it's really important that it's rooted in that observation. So uh, Jesper, welcome to the show. Um, give Thanks us a quick so little background on, on you. You definitely come from the music side, but you are no stranger to technology as well. So uh, talk to us about it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a classical composer. Uh, so I had a premiere the other week with the San Francisco Symphony. So I write for uh, contemporary cl classical music, which is like the, the, the narrowest of the narrowest of the narrowest type of music uh, with a, a very exploratory and, and, and uh, research-based kind of frame set of, of, of uh, doing music. Uh, but I'm working with orchestras and ensembles around the world uh, in, in this uh, contemporary music field. But my background isn't in classical music. I didn't start as, as, a, as a violinist at five years that, that most of, of my peers have, have done more or less. So, so I started playing punk rock when I was like 15, 16, because uh, we had a fun band name or something. So we just like, oh, let's start a band. 
Uh, what was, was the band name? <laughs> <laughs> you, it, it was so bad. So it was really like, we found, yeah, we should call ourselves Beatless. So a punk band. Beatless. Yeah. And then someone okay. like, yeah. hey, mine, mine was, mine was premonition, the feeling that something <laughs> bad is going to happen. Yeah. So, but, but hey. then so someone said, yeah, you know, there are five cover bands here in, in this part of Stockholm that are called Beatless. So maybe you want to pick another band name. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we, instead we found uh, Miklanti Kutli. Which is the death god of of, of uh, uh, South America. So that was better. But that was, was cool. that the transition <laughs> into a into a thrash metal band? Though? Exactly. Yeah. So I was so lucky that two 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 of my friends they could actually play. Uh, I couldn't play anything, but uh, they they actually started then a band called Entombed that became world leading in thrash metal. So they were yeah, really good at that. Know, Entombed, yeah. Yeah. So so uh, I was lucky, and, and I could like piggyback off of them. They they played, and I tried to write songs somehow. I just like sat there with the keyboard and, and hammered out. And those songs, they they after a few years, we got a, like a violin in the band and a saxophone and a new band, and, and like th things started to grow. And I started to realize that I never practiced my instrument, but I wrote songs. So I was not a musician. And if I was something, it was a composer. And I didn't know what a composer was, but it was like, okay, I, I do music. So I started looking into these like long songs that I had, and that I, I should probably arrange them somehow. And I probably need to, have to learn how to read and write music in my, in my 20s. And then I realized that you could actually study composition. Like, wow, that's great. Uh, let's do that. <laughs> uh, okay, it comes from the classical side. Yeah, I'll try that. And then that was really like my way into into the, the this way of, of, of composing music. So I've always worked with technology, uh, even though I, I love writing scores and I have like very detailed uh, big scores uh, for my music and, and I love that. But I don't start there. I start with listening. And that's why I always use technology. So I use many different approaches throughout the years. But after my studies at in Paris at the uh, Centre Pompidou there and at Stanford in the U.S. and here in Stockholm, I realized I needed to make myself a tool that I used to, to, to compose. So so this was in 2007, so a long time ago. And I took a Wacom tablet before the iPad and I took a, a programming language called Max MSP where you can define rules in different ways. And I set up a way of like being able to improvise, uh, set up the rules for the music and then being free to improvise within those the, within that space. And it was a lot of fun. I used it for all my pieces, and I still use it for all my pieces. Uh, and when I was uh, in, invited to talk about my music in, in different uh, universities and conservatories, uh, I showed that, and I realized that other composers were, were also interested. <clears throat> so we got some governmental funding here in Sweden, and we released an app called Gesturement. Uh, uh, it's been around for some time and a few iterations. Uh, and then it took some time to realize what a good fit this technology actually was for the video game market, because I'm not a gamer myself. But we started work, working with a video game composer here in Sweden, who said that this is the missing piece that we, that we really lack in the, in when composing video game music. Because as you said before, everything else has went to from being hard coded to being rule based, <clears throat> and this is a rule based system that is composable. It's not a, a randomizer putting out a few pitches here and there. You can actually compose the music as you usually would, but then you can make it relative instead of hard coded. So all of a sudden there was this, there was this huge possibility of making just better video game music, more cinematic, more responsive uh, in many ways. So it was uh, when, when David and, and uh, a few other uh, video game veterans from, from the UK come in, came into this, it was really fun to see the, the, the convergence that we could make happen from this. Amazing. Well, yeah. one thing that you that you uh, glossed over rather quickly, the gesturement, uh, we'll post a video to this demonstration that you did uh, in, in Mark's wonderful write ups that he does after the show. But think of it as a thing for the audience. Think of it as like if you've ever seen a theremin, right, that you can control pitch and stuff with your hands. Uh, this is a theremin expanded multiple times and doing crazy things. So we'll definitely post that. Yes, but really interesting. One question for you related to this. Uh, when, you, when you're when you basically just like, hey, I want to build something that will help me compose. I want to build a tool, a technology that will help me compose because I want to do it for me, right? Um, what was one of the rules in this rule-based engine that you were putting together that you found most universally applicable to your composition projects? One that always came up, you're like, yeah, that's right again, you know, like... <laughs> Uh, if, I'm not sure I can answer that question. I can answer it from from, from a different angle. Uh, I think that the because first I was just I was so certain that someone had done this before. 
it felt like it was too obvious not to have been done before. So I, I because I had all these contacts throughout the world with, with all the research centers, and I just checked, oh, but you have this, right? You have this, you have this, you have this. And no one had it. So I was like, okay, there is something here that I, I probably have to do myself. And I think that the, the key thing for me was uh, to have something that is organic or like produces an, a, a music that is organic, uh, which it becomes when you use movements. So you can set up the scales and rhythmic patterns and, and instrumentation and all those things. And just with the movement, then it was with a pen and or you could do a motion sensor as you describe in the video that you will post. Uh, it's it's something that you 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 can really feel the physicality of music and and like the organic phrases of it and organic doesn't mean uh, always going in one direction or or smooth it can be very sudden it's also organic but to, just to have like the, the physicality of it so I think that was really key and also look just some practical things of I come from a family of, of Swedish folk musicians <clears throat> and in in the Swedish traditional folk music uh, there is a lot of microtonality like in between the piano keys, the pitches in between. They were actually called blue notes 300 years ago. So mm. far long, long before the blues, uh, they were called blue notes, light blue and dark blue, depending on how you intonated them and how you came to them. So those pitches aren't available in, 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 in most digital or, or, or uh, keyboard based uh, instruments. So I wanted to be able to, to, to work with that because that is, it's part of my heritage that I, that I work a lot with. So those kind of things to be able to, to control that and to, to, to also to morph between different states, different tonalities and different things. So like have a gradual change of the rules that I was playing with. If I describe the technology in one sentence, it's like in between a playable instrument and a composed piece of music. So you can set up the rules, but you can still play it. And that's a new area. And that's why it was such a, a per perfect match also for the video game industry. I, was, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, I, just, I think it's great as well that you said this was 2007 and it hasn't really changed since then. So you're still using the same essentially toolkit that you were then. So that's no. interesting. Um, what was the spark though for the video game what, what in your head was it a person was it an experience was it somebody you, a company you're working for that suddenly you realized actually cinematic this would work in computer games so multiple multiple paths towards this so first i just had this wacom tablet and i was working with it and we, we were about to release the app <clears throat> and i composed a piece in france uh, for a percussion soloist uh, and we and he had been working a lot with motion sensors so we just said should we try with motion sensor and control this this musical engine because what it is and what what the patent on, on our technology is it's like a musical engine a musical core that that can can understand music and and is driven in real time depending on the rules you set up and the input it gets so we started driving that with with the with the motion sensor and directly i was like okay i've stumbled upon something that is huge uh, because the feeling that you had when when doing it, it was it was great working with the tablet but just moving around and your movements shaping not just one instrument but like a full orchestra uh, following your every movement and we've expanded it's true that the, the core is the same since 2007 but of course there's been tons of development since and one of the last things we did in the piece in san francisco it was a violin concerto conducted by esa pekka salen and their chief conductor and the violin played by pekka kusisto fantastic finnish violinist and of course i've been using motion sensors for other instruments before the clarinet player can do it with with one hand and play a clarinet with one hand but a violin player can't really do that uh, you can't have a motion sensor while playing a violin so we developed a way of having the sound drive this virtual orchestra so you have this this still the same musical motor uh, understanding the context but driven then by his playing so he had a string orchestra following his every playing. So if he played slow, it, it followed. If he played high, it followed there. So you could really like follow him with whatever, whatever he do, did. And that kind of, of like having different ways of controlling it, game parameters, audio, motions, whatever. But the core is still the same. Amazing. Yeah, I think one of, one of the big trends that, that everyone's been hearing about lately is, is the whole personalization of the music experience, right? And we're hearing a lot of uh, a lot of good, a lot of in between, maybe a little bit of not so good. But, you know, as as part of let's let's talk about what you guys 
are feeling both from the musician perspective, right? Because when you create music, if I create a record, if I write a song, record it, it's a capture of my emotion, my content, my story, my playing. And some musicians kind of view that as a, a bit of a sacred kind of thing that we've locked at in a moment in time. But now, like if my if I have like a bunch of fans that I want to create new experiences, I could open up that song for participation in some way or another by my fan base. So like, let's talk through that both from the musical perspective, Jesper, and then David also from like the gaming perspective on what gamers are looking for in that regard. Should I start from the music side and then leave over to you, David? Yeah. yeah. I, I think that uh, I really, uh, before we, we started working with the games, I, I really had this vision of like bringing back the home musicianship of the 19th century, but with today's technology. Before recordings, if you wanted to listen to music, you had to play music or go to a concert, of course. But it's it's really like, and that kind of engagement, it, it ties in so well with, with so many trends in, in, in society and, and, and uh, all cultural experiences nowadays with co-creation. You want to be part of your own experience uh, and not that listening is a passive thing. It can be super active, but you, you more and more people also want to engage. And this technology and the video you talked about before where, where I'm using a motion sensor with the with this technology, <clears throat> that's actually something that could be applicable for a meeting of uh, uh, an artist and their fans. You can have uh, an artist playing live in a studio, broadcast that throughout the world. Everyone who experiences that uh, concert real time in the live can actually interact with the accompaniment of that song while the artist still has control over the global sounding result. So everyone shaping their own version of it in real time together with the artist within the artist's control. So that's 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 key. That's super key, right? Because like if you tell the artist, hey, you have ultimate creative exactly. state control of what's going on, exactly. but we can create this new. That's really important. Mm. Yeah, I like. It. So that's really ties in that that and that's really uh, common to to or uh, close to what we're doing with the games industry. Excellent. So David, what are yeah, what are what are gamers looking for, and, yeah. and what are you seeing on that side, and how this tech can influence it? Yeah, if I step back a little bit, I mean, what got me really passionate when I met the guys in Sweden for the first time? Well, actually, met over Zoom because we were in in the pandemic, but um, eventually met was that what they had was this rule based music engine. Um, so we we did some um, due diligence on the tech and some due diligence with consumers. And we, we sort of did our long interviews with consumers of sort of all genders, all ages, mm -hmm. casual, hardcore. And we talked to them about their music listening habits, but also their gaming habits. And one of the things that was very clear and what, why I was excited about the rule based engine was Gamers were getting tired of the looping music, even though there's a lot of clever stuff done in games today. They were turning everything off and they were listening to Apple or Spotify in the background. So really a lot of the stuff that had been put together by the developers and game designers was sort of lost. Um, what also became clear was that they didn't have a huge interest in the sync deals that brought in tracks that just streamed over their gameplay, streamed over everything else. What they actually wanted was music to have a place within the game. So if they if they were able to personalize with music, that it actually in some way impacted the game, the visuals, the soundtracks, the stingers. So that, that sort of led us um, down the path of, of how we were going to work with the technology and present that to developers. But then I think I think where we, we made um, the, the step to create the reactional platform was driven by by what they'd said. You know, the idea, well, what if we could bring all the music they were wanting to listen to when they were turning off the gameplay? What if we could bring that to them so they could bring the music they love, their sort of the soundtrack of their life into their gaming world, the, the properly convergence of gaming and music? Um, so that, that, that ended up being an interesting journey because obviously you've got two very successful creative industries that operate in very different ways. Um, so you've got the game on one side and music on the other. So, um, uh, you know, while Jesper's talked a lot about the flexibility, the technology and what it can do, we had to approach it. How could you make that technology work for the music industry as it stands today? Um, albeit that we can do a lot more. And one of the things that was was untouchable was the the master that we couldn't actually create derivative works or play around with the master. So I think with the technology, we we um, 
the, the guys developed a proprietary music analysis engine that can take any track or any piece of music and it attaches metadata to it, such as chord key, etc. And when that track then is brought into the game by a gamer, the game soundtrack, the stingers, and if the developer set it up, the visuals, everything within the game they've been playing instantly reads the metadata. And that's what reacts. It's suddenly, it's in key, it's in beat, it's in time with the piece of music that's been brought in. So for a gamer sitting playing the game, they just feel like, wow, I've just transformed the whole my whole gaming experience with this piece of music. Yeah. So to say our, that... So I was going to say to our listeners that me and Jamie have experienced this firsthand and everything, yeah, everything is in key. Everything is malleable. Everything fits to in sync with the part of the game that you wanted to. Um, just for our non-gamers, what's a stinger? A stinger is like a sound effect that can can happen when something happens within the game. Yeah, so, oh, so like you, you, you know, open a chest or you you open fight. a chest or uh, um yeah or something you know you destroy the evil warlord and you know there's a but speaking of the evil warlord this is really important because since we have this metadata on the track uh, that we don't touch but bring into the game, uh, we can also let the music control the visuals in the game what you see so in a, in a cinema if you watch a movie and uh, the boss is defeated you expect the boss to fall down and land boom on a heavy beat in the music of course nothing else makes sense in the game that almost never happens but since we have uh, the, the, the beat data we can make sure that, okay but just slow down his fall a little bit and there it comes and so far you could do basically the same thing with the tools that people have today since you have hard-coded music you have to make sure that the boss falls on a beat but now we want the the gamers to be able to switch the music so instead of having the the the, the music that is in there you want to bring in a brahms symphony or a metallica track the boss will still fall on beat and that's really crucial just one more thing that david has been talking about with with, with opening up uh, uh, for, 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 uh, for the gamer to choose. It's also super crucial to say that, that the video game studios, of course, always have artistic control, coming back to what we talked about, uh, of an artist uh, having con artistic control. If you have a, a video game where you want the experience to be set in uh, New Orleans in the 1920s, and you only want people to listen to 20s jazz, perfectly fine. You just curate that. You can still have in-game purchases of different songs and different song packs of, of, of different uh, emotions in there within that world, but you define the rules of it, of course. That's very so. Um... So my my tech my technical brain is is kind of latching onto it to a concept I didn't get when I was looking through the demo. Um, but it so there the reason why we the reason why the new song or the potential of a new song to be imported in, into the game is kind of paired with the existing scores because the rules based engine of the, of the game engine has the music has already been programmed to do certain things to hit at certain points exactly. to be certain things exactly. so the new song is jumping onto the path of the old song it's that just, it's makes... just hooks it's just hooks so is that okay these flowers should bounce in time with the music no matter which track it is brahms or metallica yeah. it doesn't matter no matter the no matter the rhythm or whatever exactly. it's just a rule it, that's amazing. Okay, so that that makes a whole lot of sense uh, to me. So, all right, let's talk about the two different paths that Reactional has, right? You're you're talking about um, a solution that's going to be amazing for game developers on the front end, but also a solution that is eventually going to be applicable when I'm in Fortnite and I'm in the Fortnite lobby. I can pull down one of my favorite songs and you know, pay for that experience to to have that song be in my experience in the game, right? So let's talk from the developer side first, the game studios, what does reactional mean to those guys? Well, I, I think apart from the, the flexibility, even if they're using their own composable music that, that Jesper touched on earlier, and what that gives them in the same way that they have it with graphics, physics and lighting, you know, for things to generate, for thing, you know, for music to be linked to threat level, to time of day, to health level, whatever it may be, the ability for them to put in those rules. When it actually comes to them bringing in other music you know i think one of the things is uh, for a developer um purely on the commercial side it turns it turns music in from a cost to when they release the game it turns it into a revenue earner so commercially you know that's that's a positive from the developer side 
but it's the, it's the ability for them in the same way now. I mean, the reason we went with the, the platform was at the end of 23, I looked at the overall gaming market. It was close to $180 billion, 74% of it in-game purchases. So, you know, you, you, you've got personalization driving a lot of the growth in gaming and music playing close to 0% of that. So you, you'd got, you know, if, if, if we all talked about our lives and how big a part, you know, music is probably most the most defining part of a lot of people's lives. And the idea that you've got, um, you know, three billion gamers who don't have the ability to use music um, as, as personalization when they're doing, you know, when they're actually gaming and interacting with their friends and other people online seemed a little bit crazy. So in the same way now that a developer would tag change your, you know, change your cap, Jeremy, change the wheels on your car, change your weapon, your appearance. For the first time, they're going to be able to put tags in in different parts of the game that says change, you know, change the music. And whether that's bringing in a whole track or you talked about an end of level boss fight, we're also doing what's called a music mode, which is a five to 20 second burst of that track that you may want to bring in every time I score a goal or a touchdown or end a level boss fight or a flare, which is a zero to five second burst of a track that may you use it to punctuate your gameplay. So from a developer, it gives them the flexibility to use music as an in-game purchase. But I think creatively, the other important thing is at the moment with music being hard coded, the audio team quite often work quite separately from the game development because they can't bring anything in until the gameplay, the game development's quite far down the line. Because it's um, been generated live note by note from a prototype with a simple API link, the games composer, the audio team can be involved with the development team and actually, you know, work with them right from the very start and in some way guide game design because they're able to go in, jump back out into their workstation, make changes, jump back into the gameplay and say, okay, is this what you were thinking? So the actual workflow side works very well for the developer. Okay. We're trying to simplify the, the like the, the meeting point of, of composer and, and game developer. So the composer sets up the rules for the, the interactive part of the music. Maybe I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit and come back to this because just wanted to because we're talking about two things that might sound like they're completely different. We're talking about note by note generated music and we're talking about uh, fixed track recorded music. And reactional technology is both. We have uh, what we call a reactional theme, as uh, the Harry Potter theme, that adapts to the different scenarios. It is you still recognize the melody, but it's different in different situations. You have the reactional theme, which is the the, the music in the game. As we said, the stingers, uh, melodic motifs, uh, the di different things that is composed in the ordinary way. But now, instead of being hard coded, it's malleable. It's it's changeable, morphable. And that can then adapt to the reactional track, uh, a full to recorded master that we map with metadata of pitch and, and rhythm. So those two come together. And that means that you, you can have something that is like, as, as David said, it's there from the start. It's just a few things and you can actually just drive some parameters. So the composer defines the rules of the reactional theme. Uh, how, how should threat sound? How 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 is how does health sound? And the game developer just gets that parameter. Okay, I, I, I want to map this to proximity to monster or whatever you want. And then they can talk about it in a very more abstract way. So it simplifies the communication as well. And then with this rule-based engine that that lives in, you know, you had mentioned, uh, I think we had learned before that it's, you know, you have something for Unity and you're working on something for Unreal and that this would live in, a game studio's proprietary engine as as a bit of a plugin, but what you're doing is you're creating the ability for multiple things to run, run through that engine. Number one, the composer score that can now do very different things and really cool stuff, but also other music flowing through that same rules based engine. I think it's I think it's really cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is very cool. Can I so that's from the developer point of view, and I believe that the developer they they will be the first to use this this technology before the actual gamer uses it is that correct it, it first developers then the gamers yes yeah yes and no yeah but but basically yeah uh, okay. so so we also have some direct paths to to gamers but but most of the time it will be through through the okay well, okay i'm a gamer i'm playing i don't know like 
Monkey Island, God of War, whatever it is. Could you talk me through what it, the experience will look like for me? Like, do I need any musical experience to do this? First of all, is it is it something that only musicians can do? And mm. if I'm okay, we spoke about Metallica, so we, we're going to put Metallica into Monkey Island. I want to line up like 10, 10 tracks. Do I line up the 10 tracks before I start playing into the engine? Do I, how much kind of setup is there before I go into the game? And then how much is there during the game that I have to do as a gamer, if anything? So th this was a really crucial thing that uh, we, we talked about these issues uh, early on with, 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 uh, with David and people from the games industry and from the music industry. How, how should we solve this issue? We realized very early on that we are not the ones to solve that because it will be so different from game to game. Some games will have uh, in-game currencies. Some games will be ad-driven, free-to-play. Some will be have lots of, of, of the lobbies, time and setup. Where it's so different. So we will not be able to, we, we should not be, be, be the ones to impose how this is done. Uh, that must be the, in, in the in the game studio's interest to, to design. But we, of course, man make sure that they have the tools to do it in, in different ways. So if we talk about uh, a smaller indie developer who, who doesn't have the time or resources to make an in-game store for, for purchases and stuff like that, we've developed a simple way for them to still be able to facilitate and, and use this, uh, the, the possibility of having gamers buy music as an in-game purchase through an app that we do. So they can go to, to, to that app and, and uh, browse and, and, and buy whatever tracks they want and just say, okay, now I want to play this level with this playlist. And then they do that. So in that way, since they don't have anything built in because it's a small indie studio, then we help them with that. Larger games, they will do it in many different ways and we, we will never know. We, this is also one of the exciting parts. We don't know how people will start using it. It's just now we opened up the beta. So we, we're bound to see so many things happening that we would never have envisioned when we did it. Is it, is it safe to say it's this is almost like um, uh, music infrastructure for gaming, like interactive music infrastructure for gaming for developers to use in, in various ways that we don't even know yet? Yeah, yeah we've, we've, had people, we've had people describe it in different ways. I mean, from the music side, a lot of the rights holders I'm talking with see it as a new music consumption platform you know, as, as their window to these 3 billion gamers. We work very closely with um, media research. And one of the things they showed in, um, in research recently was that gamers significantly over-index in their consumption of music and music merchandise. So you've kind of got over 3 billion gamers who are already, you know, sweet spot, who have got an economy that they use already for buying in-game. But we're just adding music to that. And from the music side, the other thing they look at it very strongly, you know, this is like an A&R play. It's like a discovery platform. You know, a lot, a, not surprisingly, a lot of artists or musicians are, I mean, gamers. And so therefore you're, you're getting artists who are actually um, saying, wow, I can look at my existing music, look at new music. I could compose for games. I could tease new music on here before I tease it elsewhere. So, you know, I, th I think, you know, Jesper touched on, us being able to understand what the gamers are going to do with it. The other exciting thing is for the first, you know, if somebody turns off the music now and listens to Spotify in the background, the games company doesn't know what that gamer is listening to. The music company doesn't know what game they're playing when they're listening to that, that, that track. So we're going to have data that can flow from the middle out both ways that will help formulate and bring the two industries closer together, particularly, you know, whether it's an artist working with a games franchise, they never realized that they, they, you know, they had you know, fandom within that games franchise. Yeah, there's a lot of potential for fandoms within games franchise. And I know that we've spoken a lot, Jamie, between kind of grassroots musicians and large musicians and that bi-directional value exchange. You can imagine maybe incorporating some blockchain technology into this token gated ex gaming experience where the new music is only playable in this level of this game or something that, kind of suits rewards everybody involved it's yeah potentials pretty impressive. yeah the, the interesting piece about all of this is is that gaming in general has been testing music interaction in in different ways right we've yeah. we've seen what Fortnite has done with all of their concerts and roblox and all of that but there hasn't been this interaction it's still relatively broadcast audience versus this this interaction right so another yeah. thing that i 
that, that I, that I think about too, is music is a, is a number one passion point for people, right? It's, it's a, it's a source of identity. Um, you know, I use a fitness analogy, right? So as you, as I'm in a workout, there are certain songs that take me to different levels of performance, right? And that data is already there. There've been amazing studies in that, but that is definitely going to apply to some of these, some like going to influence performance and all of that stuff. Like, have you guys thought about any of that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We, 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 in that very space, we've got someone who's working in the gaming space purely around a fitness product that is working with us because that, that's exactly what they're trying to achieve. They're wanting to give that flexibility. As we said earlier, we, we can't pretend to, do, to understand what our developers going to do with it. But I think the most exciting thing is what are gamers going to do with it? You know, at the at the moment, as you say, it is a little bit like the 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 developers, albeit with some flexibility in certain titles, but they're almost deciding what is the music their their gamers want to hear. You know, suddenly we're going to have this creativity. You know, we touched earlier on games being developed, game game industry starting with people building games in their bedroom. As the whole creator thing has come round, we're seeing that all come back round again. Um, and I, I think what we're doing with the platform is is giving putting music into that creative um, arena. So I, th I think that that's where the excitement will be. Definitely resonating in the chat, guys. There, there's a lot of excitement about the potential of 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 this in gaming. Can uh, I, yes, go can ahead. I go yeah. comment on one of the things said in the chat, which is really really important? And that is that uh, music in video games. Uh, as I said, I'm not a gamer, but music in video games is a work of art there you have so yeah. many talented people doing amazing stuff uh, and has been doing for a long long time and we're not uh, trying to to say that that isn't good in any way it's it's there's so much good music i hear my kids play different games and there's fantastic stuff being done there definitely yeah. so it's it's not it's not about that it's about uh, getting those people doing the amazing stuff they're already doing but in an even more interactive uh, way and, and opening up new artistic possibilities. For instance, a multiplayer situation. You have, uh, as we said, we have the, the video game composer defining the rules of the situation. Then you can have everyone sitting around the campfire in a VR game or an online game or whatever, picking an instrument each, playing along with the background track or just jamming along without the background track everything always being in sync and in pitch and them doing a song of their of the moment still being controlled uh, globally by the, the the game composer of that game so it's really like a new way of meeting and both spurring the 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 creativity of the game composer and the gamer and i think that's the really important part yeah there's no this isn't a zero sum game some of these cinematic games are like as Flo said, works of art where the music is essential for the experience of the game. Yes. I think like gamers, people of a certain age, our age, when we think of gaming, we think of consoles and PCs. And obviously that's not where the growth is. That's not where the future lies necessarily. It's in mobile gaming and to a lesser extent, perhaps browser gaming. How is this all set up is it possible to do it on mobile apps? Yeah, yeah. No, so this is uh, since it also it comes from an app uh, at the start. The core technology is, uh, is is a library written in C without any dependency. It's being a little bit technical here, but it's really something that is portable everywhere, and it's a very very small uh, library. It's, it's just since it's just data. It's musical data. It's about musical rules. It's not big. Then, of course, depending on how large you want the sample libraries be and then how, how much you, the, the sound quality of, of the things, that, that, that then it become a little bit bigger depending on how you do it. But basically, the footprint is really, really small and it's portable everywhere. We have it in the browser. We have it on Unity and Unreal. Uh, we have it on console. So it's, it's really portable everywhere. Awesome. You know what? You know what gets me thinking. We talked about like discoverability of of new artists, the A and R kind of aspect of this. So I think about my son the other day. He was playing Call of Duty, and he, you know, how they do clips, and they'll grab clips. Like, Dad, check out this three hundred and sixty headshot that I did. And I'm like, part of me concerned as a dad that he <laughs> is showing me that, but part of me is like, wow, that's kind of cool, right? But what if, what if, you know, th the idea is that he's able to like grab his favorite band and throw him into that clip, and then you get into this almost you know, musically before TikTok was around and how that all came about with little snippets of songs being in these like memeable situations. 
um, that could be that could be that could be really interesting from a discoverability standpoint. I think. Yeah, and creative standpoint. Yeah, exactly. yeah, no, definitely. Amazing. Well, man, I there there's so much I want to dive into, <laughs> and we are we are so limited on on time. We want to be respectful of of all of that. Tell us where people can learn more about the updates and what you're doing, both if they're game developers listening, both of you know, music tech enthusiasts, and then also gamers. Like, where can people find out more about this stuff on their own? I think the, be the best thing at the moment is, um, is to actually go, and I know you posted earlier, thank you, Mark, is to go to reactionalmusic.com. Because um, that's set up um, whether you're a, a rights holder, whether you're a um, developer, um, whether you're a gamer, as to um, you know, ask, contact us, ask questions, find out what it means for each of each of the different people that is impacting. And we are definitely it, 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 some, some games. So like, so there are already game studios uh, retrofitting this to existing games, and some are in development of new games. And these cycles can be very different. Some are very long, can take several years, and some are shorter. But there are also ways of, of uh, meeting gamers in a more direct way that we hopefully be able to, to announce rather soon. So th there will be many different different ways. Someone asked about independent artists doing concerts, uh, and that's exactly what I'm describing. I think that's something that we, we see coming through games or other type of, of uh, online situations that are, are, because both Unity and Unreal, they see also the potential of their engines for other types of interactive experiences, not just uh, games, games, but m many different situations. And of course, concerts could be one of them. Yeah, it's interesting. I see someone else just commenting there on the, um, you know, on concerts on in individual events with huge views. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the discussions I had had recently on the music side was that while that creates huge discoverability, um, it also from for the label and for the publisher takes quite a lot of work to put it together, quite a lot of money. Um, and then it happens and creates a huge explosion. And then, well, they, they actually said, and in 72 hours, it's gone. I think it lasts a little bit longer. But um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think the, their, their view was that th this is something that gives music and their artists 24-7 exposure globally. Um, and it allows them to see creativity right across the board as to what gamers and developers are wanting to do with the music. So they, they thought it was probably going to be a mix of both. Absolutely. So another another question came in uh, from Rob. Is there is there a game that's live now that 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 we could see this stuff in, or is it getting we're getting close? Yeah, we're getting close. We're not there yet, we're but close. we're getting close. So so there are several several companies working on it right now, and and uh, we're exploring several routes, but uh, not not yet. Soon. Amazing. Well, stay stay tuned, Rob. It's it's coming quick. These guys have. Uh, been working with this tech for a while and uh and there are some great partnerships that they will be able to probably announce pretty soon that you will you will have name recognition with i'm sure yeah um brilliant. awesome yeah could i like just i know we we kind of have to wrap up and there's probably a lot of questions and i think that rob and matt and Flo in the chat would probably stay for another hour but it, it rob matt and Flo, if you have any further questions just shoot us to us on linkedin and we'll get them to david and jesper and try and get them answered and um, just an observation i know that a lot of the shows we've had recently we've been talking about ip and copyright and it kind of like the ship of thesis when does something become different to what it was i mean if you change it and is the song still the song and i think unlike a lot of the things we've spoken about in the past this is is not as it's not as it's not as it doesn't change or transform the game in the same way we've spoke about the music being transformed by ai here it's very additional it kind of tweaks the gameplay it tweaks the experience but it doesn't change the game from something to something different it's like an addition and i really like that and i think it's a powerful use of the tech which kind of which i'm very very impressed by if that makes sense because obviously we, in the past we've spoken a lot about ai just changing everything and this isn't that no i think that's really important it's been for, important both for the for the games industry and for the music industry yeah. to to make sure because it's also one of those things to because this is it is a, a generative technology uh it's not ai in the in the 
common way of using that today with with the uh, machine learning and stuff but it's like constrained programming so there are there are a generative aspect to it so the first investors we we met when when starting this company they said yeah that's great you have something that can get rid of the composers not a no, that's not really where I'm coming from. So, so we've always come from the other angle. We want to empower the video game studios and, and the creators in the video game industry and the composers there. And we want to empower the musicians and, and the creators in the music industry. And also widen the, the, the amount of, of, of possibilities. Like you have an, an indie game and they, they do an epic game, but they don't have an orchestra. It is impossible. Well, but maybe in our catalog, we actually have recordings of a piece by Brahms or a, a contemporary composer that they can actually use and access and, 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 and get to work in their game. It's also like opening up more possibilities to, to everyone involved. Yeah, that's a that's a key takeaway of yeah. this is this is this is not a technology to replace an existing system, but to enhance an existing yeah. system. It's really important to that 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 it's not doing away with composers. It's actually opening the door to new opportunities. But on the on the other side of that, the ability to bring in music, right? So just like a film, film has a composer, but film also has a music supervisor that licenses tracks and brings it in. It's anything that's built on a previous model that that takes it to a next level always excites me. And I think that's what you guys are are doing very, very well. Um, David Jesper, thanks for joining us today. And thanks mm -hmm. for uh, giving yeah. us a little insight into this. Mark will do a brilliant write up on um, where to stay in touch. And, and we'll have some videos that you sent that we'll post as well. But um, this is one of the coolest tools on the you know reinvention of music and gaming that i've seen yeah. and i look forward to seeing where where this goes um thanks, thanks for joining last quick shout out to our friends at ripple w-r-i-p-p-l-e marketing's on-demand talent platform again q4 new assignment coming in bring in uh an expert like mark fielding to help you write copy that will sell your widgets um uh, w -R -I -P -P -L -E. <laughs> yeah, I struggle with that word, Mark. I don't know. It creeps me out just a touch. Um, but if you want to hear more about us, guys, thanks for listening. I see a lot of new listeners in the chat. We're here every week, um, Thursday, 1030 uh, Eastern. And uh, thinking on paper.xyz, all the old episodes are on Spotify and on YouTube. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, help unpack this stuff. We're thankful for our audience. Mark, any closing thoughts? Um, I think you've covered everything there. Just say half past three GMT for the our European friends. Don't forget it's Thursday afternoon. Um, yeah, write-ups on thinking on paper.xyz, subscribe on YouTube and tell a friend, just tell one friend who'd be interested in listening to this kind of stuff because we do this every week. Cheers, guys. Thanks so much. We'll Thank see you, you next week. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.